fate truly is a cruel mistress, dear viewer. No matter how much knowledge you have of what's coming, no matter how hard you try to warn people or change the course of events, certain things are simply inevitable. Like The Flash being a steaming pile of garbage that nobody wants to watch. I mean, to be fair, you didn't exactly have to be Mystic Meg to make that particular prediction. It was a film that had almost everything going against it. A lame duck movie from a dead cinematic universe at a time when the superhero genre is in decline anyway, relying on the played out trope of the multiverse to shoehorn in a bunch of meaningless cameos that do nothing but remind us of better days long gone, and based around an unpopular character played by an actor with, uh, personal issues. Hi, um, this is Ezra Miller, the Mad Goose Wizard. What the fuck is that? Nice one, Ezra. Never change. It all added up to a film with all the prospects of Peter Dinklage in the NBA, but here we are, six directors, a quarter of a billion dollars, and god knows how many rewrites and reshoots later. But damn man, even I didn't expect it to be this much of an overblown, chaotic, unfocused, visually disgusting mess. The Flash is basically two hours of creative diarrhea, a messy combination of good ideas, baffling cameos and deep references that casual fans won't even get, and absolute dogshit CGI splattered all across the screen. Anyway, grab your spandex running suit and let's do our best to make sense of this. So the movie opens with nobody's favourite superhero Barry Allen, who's on his way to court for his father's final appeal against his life sentence for the murder of his wife. Unfortunately, Barry gets held up by an emergency where he has to save a bunch of fallen babies by throwing them into microwaves. And if that sounds like I've been on the toilet duck again, then yes, I have. But it's also a thing that actually happens in this movie, and yes, it is as dumb as it sounds. It's also a convenient excuse to shoehorn in a couple of cameos from Batman and Wonder Woman. And don't worry, if you like meaningless cameos that go nowhere, there's going to be plenty more on the way. Believe that! Anyway, Barry goes back to his childhood home to reminisce and then gets sad and ends up running so fast that he travels back in time. I mean, we've all done it, right? And this gives Barry a bit of an idea. What if he went back in time to the day of his mother's murder and changed things so that she never got killed? Bruce doesn't think this is a very good idea to go messing with the timeline because of every single time travel movie ever, but Barry's like, nah, it'll be fine. So back he goes and saves his mum. Job done, mission complete. Except it isn't because now he finds himself in 2013, right before the events of Man of Steel, where he runs into a younger version himself that doesn't have his powers yet. And this is where you need to strap yourself in, dear viewer, because if you thought that one Ezra Miller on screen was more abrasive than Aquafina trying to rap... Remember my song in the swamp when I was like, wah, chicka, wah, wah, chicka. <laughs> Well, all I can say is that the rest of the movie's gonna be a bit of a slog for you. Anyway, they're interrupted by the arrival of General Zod, who's on Earth looking for Superman. So the two Barrys decide they have to bring together the Justice League to fight him. The only problem is that they don't actually exist here. Cyborg is still just a college football player, Aquaman was apparently never born, and Wonder Woman is... uh on vacation or something? I don't fucking know because the script doesn't seem to know either. The only option left is Bruce. So they go to Wayne Manor to find him, except he's not the Bruce Wayne that they remember. And take note of this segment because it's one of the few parts of the movie that's actually pretty good. Anyway, so this is the Bruce Wayne from Batman 1989, who's since retired after basically solving all the crime in Gotham City. Nice one, Bruce. Anyway, the Barrys are able to persuade him to come out of retirement on the grounds that the entire world is about to end. And together they journey to Siberia where they recover Superman from the sealed prison that he's being held in. Except it's not Superman, it's Supergirl in this reality. Why? Don't know. So they take Supergirl out to the desert where General Zod's been fighting the world's military for what seems like weeks now. Doesn't seem like a very efficient use of your time Zod, but whatever. But oh no, she gets killed by him. And so does Bruce. So the Barrys travel back to try and fix it, but no matter what they do, General Zod just keeps on winning. And then the younger Barry starts to go a bit nuts from all the time travel and turns into an evil old version of Flash before ultimately sacrificing himself to wipe out his own timeline. And other Barry finally comes to the realisation that the only way to put things right is to undo his choice to save his mum from the start of the movie. So he does and everything goes back to normal, more or less, and his dad wins the court case and they all live happily ever after. Except for the horrifying realisation that George Clooney is now Bruce Wayne again. <laughs> 
Never leave the cave without him. You know, I've used the term Frankenstein's monster quite a bit to describe movies over the past few years, but honestly, it's tough to think of a more accurate metaphor for what the Flash is. It seems to have been assembled from the chunks of like a dozen other aborted scripts and half-baked ideas, awkwardly stitched together into something that vaguely resembles a story, and jolted into life in the hopes that it'll shamble around long enough to make back its massive budget. And if the opening box office is anything to go by, well, it won't. The first half is probably the more focused and coherent, but ironically it's the least enjoyable, mainly because it's centred entirely around Barry. Both of him. And that's a problem because the worst aspect of the Flash movie is the Flash himself. Specifically, Ezra Miller's take on the Flash. Basically, he's just as hyperactive, verbose and gratingly irritating as he was in Justice League, always trying too hard to be funny, trying too hard to be likeable, trying too hard to act, and having two of them play off each other just multiplies the problem exponentially. You can tell there's been a real concerted effort to rehabilitate Miller's public image in the weeks leading up to this film, with so many drooling articles all saying basically the same thing that you'd swear they'd been given talking points specifically by the studio. Ezra Miller has never gone Ezra Miller the way they do in The Flash. With sculpted dark eyebrows and insinuating lips, the actor is a mesmerising camera subject, like the young Jimmy Fallon crossed with the young Bob Dylan. Jesus Christ, calm down a bit, mate. This is the journalistic equivalent of blowing him right in front of the entire world. But none of that can change what's actually up there on screen, and if your main character is the least likeable part of your movie, well, you know you've got problems. As far as the other characters go, I can't say a whole lot about Supergirl because she's less of a character than a key item that has to be recovered to move the plot forwards. You never get a whole lot of insight into who she is because she arrives late to the party and doesn't get enough time to make an impression. And it's kind of a shame because the actress does a decent job and I wouldn't have minded seeing more of her, but she gets kind of lost in the chaotic, overstuffed mess that is the film's second hour. General Zod is a fucking weird choice of antagonist for a Flash movie, a character from a movie ten years ago that has absolutely zero history or connection to Barry. It'd be like bringing back the Red Skull and having him fight Doctor Strange. I mean, in the hands of smarter writers, this probably could have been a chance to see a different side of him, explore aspects of his personality that we never got to see in Man of Steel, but instead he's basically just a cardboard cutout, saying and doing the same shit he did before, with no emotional impact because he doesn't even know or care who Barry is. And I think I speak for everyone when I say that we're fucking done with multiverses. It was an intriguing little idea like four or five years ago, but as we've learned from every other superhero movie that's been made on the subject, it's really just become an excuse to bring back old actors and dead characters and throw them into new situations because funny. But let's be real here, the only reason that anyone was even interested in this film was to see Michael Keaton in the Batsuit again. And for me, this was both the best and most disappointing aspect of the movie. On the plus side, Keaton's barely missed a beat in 30 years and slipped right back into the role like he's been doing it his whole life. Modern VFX and stunt work allows him to move and fight in ways that he never could have back in the Tim Burton days, and seeing the Batmobile and Wayne Manor faithfully recreated definitely gets the nostalgia going. The problem is, beyond recycling a few well-known lines, the movie doesn't seem to know what to actually do with him. His character's got no real arc or journey to go on, he doesn't learn or change in any way, and he's not around long enough to really connect with Barry as the paternal figure that I think they were going for. Also, this movie basically proves my point that Batman is not compatible with big Marvel-style battles against alien armies and giant sky beams. He's a crime fighter that's supposed to be leaping across rooftops and stalking the dark alleyways of Gotham, not taking on giant CGI monsters in the middle of the desert in broad daylight. It's such a cheap, shitty misuse of such an awesome character, and it pretty much exemplifies DC's biggest problem of pissing away every advantage in a desperate attempt to copy Marvel. People watch your movies precisely because you're not Marvel. Why don't you fucking see that? Oh yeah, and needless to say, the visuals look like absolute donkey shit, which is par for the course with movies these days. Probably because this film was getting rewritten and reshot right up into the final whistle, and the VFX artists had no idea what they were even supposed to be rendering. There's some obnoxiously bad green screen that genuinely looks like it came from a Disney Plus show, and action set pieces that would have been cutting edge in the early 2000s but look weak as fuck today. Seriously, go back and rewatch the first Iron Man, a movie made 15 years ago with half the budget, and it'll look infinitely better than this.
All of these problems smack of a script that's trying to do way too much, cram in too many ideas and characters, too much action, too much visual spectacle, and ends up tripping over its own feet in the process. A film so desperate to impress, saddled with so many expectations and so much studio interference that it's lost sight of what it's even trying to be or do. And all it actually ended up being was the very mess that we all predicted. Fate, like I said, is a cruel mistress. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.